he felt here said, born and raised in Wilmer, uh, older brother, obviously Sam Schaefer, works with the Wilmer Police Department as a new canine officer. So I guess hopefully maybe start a family tradition here and uh, really looking forward to spending my career here in Wilmer working for you guys. So Excellent. Welcome aboard. We're glad that you're with us. So. Thank you. You bet. Have a great day. You too. You can stick around too as well, but Chief Health will probably tell you what you can do that way. So uh, we understand that chain of command in the police department, so the mayor won't tell you anything. You do whatever the chief told you. There you so, go. Okay. And we'll have uh, Officer Lloyd come to a future meeting since Perfect. he was unable to make it tonight. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have community center discussion. Rob and Britta. Chief, could you go back and check with IT and see if they have the audio fixed? That sounds to me like they have it fixed, but. Thanks. Uh, Mayor, member of the councils, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about uh, the community center and having an open discussion. Um, the history of the community center is located on 624 Highway 71 across from Robbins Island. Um, it's been under the city supervision since 1992. Um, the city has been using the facilities for a wide range of community programming and currently we've hired a new community center manager to oversee the operations. Um, some of the cur current circumstances is that the facility is in need of many repairs, um, which many of them deal with the structure of the building. Um, the recommendation is to start having discussion of the future of the community center, center and the services that we offer. Um, depending on the site, um, is this actually the best site for the community? Does it fill the needs of the users and programming opportunities? Um, what is the future for dedicated funds for the community center? And what is the next step for the community center? Um, depending on future funding, um, we'll either to add funds for maintenance or look for a new building. Okay. So discussions. Um, and I think I told me that you were going to bring the report or, or that came from the facility study on what the costs were. Did you bring that along? Yep, I did. And I asked Sean to help out as well because he's probably more familiar with it as I, than I am. But some of the um, repairs that look like need to be happen is the outside of the shell, the um, steel structure. It's rusted. It's very dented up and cracked in places. Um, also with the roof, with the snow load that we have, um, it does warp down the ceiling um, in that facility. So it's really hard to sometimes actually put the partitions out. Um, so we can separate the rooms. Um, other things that non-compliant bathrooms that need to be updated. Um, the, dark, the doors need to be replaced as well. Um, and then actually the, the space is, is asked to be remodeled. So, and do we know what that cost was? What the cost um, was? A total replacement cost of the whole facility would be 1.3 million. Okay. And then how about the repairs? Um, for like the restrooms, you're looking at $16,000. Um, to replace the outside metal panels, we're like looking at $152,000. Um, and then the space remodeling is over $100,000. So there's quite a few things that will add up to that facility to get replaced. What about the roof? Sean, is that something you can help me out with? I was thinking that was the uh, the major issue was um, the bowing of the the beams mm -hmm. and uh, and the roof. And when you say while well, he's coming up, well, you say one point three million to replace. Was that that's it with the current footage of, of the the size that it is? Correct. Yeah, and to clarify on that one point three. Um, that replaces exactly what's there now. Right. So it's not a new building, it's not new anything, it just actually replaces all the deficiencies that it has currently. The roof itself, and I don't remember where, which dollar amount it was on here, but you're exactly right, when there's, there's snow or heavy snow events, if we don't get it, if somebody doesn't get up there and push the snow off, there's certain <coughs> doors that won't open because it, it, it sags the roof or bows the roof a little bit. And so there's some structural issues that on the roof itself that need to be need to be addressed. So the basically the bottom line is what we would have to put in to 
repair it, it is, isn't fiscally responsible. Correct. We got to see what we want to put into it to get what we want out of it. Does it make sense to put that much money into a building that, you know, right. that's probably, the lifespan's probably gone on it. Okay. So I think the discussion for tonight, what we'd like to kind of frame it around is, is do we try to repair the building or do we think we need a new building? And, you know, we're, I don't want us to digress into the conversation of location. Just <clears throat> when staff starts working on this, do we want a new building or is the council thinking of a new building or trying to repair what's there? Council Mayor Osmus. I just don't feel that it's in the the best use of the taxpayers dollars to repair to put any more money into that building i mean i i i, I just really think <coughs> we should be looking at a new building it just to me it doesn't make sense to repair what we have there I just, <clears throat> um i was going to ask about that the roof do we know about the skeleton of the building the the integrity of the building as far as the uh, uh, the skeleton. I, I, I worry about if the roof is sloping in. What's supporting? What's supporting that? Why is it doing that? Um, I'm, I, I would be concerned about once we open it up, where does it stop? Yeah, exactly. So like that's um, I'm worried about that. Um, how old the building? What's the age of that, Mr. Mayor? Do you, do you recall? Do we? Does anybody recall the age of that building? I know it's. You know, I think it's 1976. It okay. It's like 80. So. Yeah, it was the, the building was built for the Elks Club. Correct. And then uh, the city took over in, what did you say, 1993? Two. 1992. Then the city acquired it from the Elks Club in 1992. Okay. And then um, I wasn't around then, but does anybody remember what? What did we do with it at that time? Did we just kind of basically convert it? We took the bar out. Remember, the bar was against the, the west wall. I'm sorry, the east wall. And then that's kind of where the kitchen is now. So, I'm, I'm leaning towards um, Julie's uh, assessment that it, it probably should be um, replaced. I don't know what we've done for maintenance over the years, but... Um, I'm thinking that it's uh, there's been some gaps. Councilman Nelson, I just wanted you to repeat the numbers and just to clarify, because you said 1.3 million to replace, mm -hmm. and then you um, said some repairs, but then you came back and said that replace didn't mean a new building. The 1.3 would be a total rebuild of rebuild. The, so of the do we do we have an estimate for total repairs or not? Um, the sheet that we got from the study has a uh, numerous different repairs that would add up. Um, I can send that to you. No, I, I think we we've gotten it before. I just was trying to clarify: was that first that one point three million actually at the time we did this study replacing the building? Correct. It yes. was. Thank you. Yep. Council Member Christians, followed by Palman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when the building was built in 76, it was built to uh, the current building code then, which included a snow load. I don't know if the roof has gotten weaker at those certain points. Uh, evidently, if the doors aren't opening, it's probably below, it's probably a bearing wall, unless it's outside doors, which I don't think would be uh, a problem. But what have we spent on it in the last, since 92? to uh, accommodate some of these mm -hmm. deficiencies. And my fear is that we haven't done much and we've known about this for 10 years. I've been in a council uh, 20 some years and we've talked about this over and over and over and nothing's been done. As some of our other city uh, facilities and buildings, uh, they, they just, they deteriorate under our watch and our staff's watch and nothing gets done. So we build a new one. In five years, 10 years, what are we going to do? Doggone, the roof is leaking. We better build another building. Um, we need to get our act together here. I, 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 I think that uh, renovating and, and upgrading that building is, is the smartest thing. 
We've heard from the seniors that that's where it should be. Now, I know the seniors aren't the only ones to use that building. It's, it's now a community center instead of a senior center. However, uh, everybody in the city is familiar with that site. It's easy ingress, easy out to get out of there. Um, as soon as High Avenue gets fixed, at least it will be. <laughs> um, I, I think we need to look at repairing it and uh, keeping it there. Uh, uh, I think it's beneficial. The site is good. And, and, and again, I, I worry about, we talk about building all these new buildings. And Vest and Homer's got these great ideas. And we aren't taking care of our current buildings. No, we just aren't. And it, part of the blame is on me. I've been on the council this long. But we've known about it, and nothing's been done. What have we spent on that building? Has anybody got uh, some kind of estimate uh, what we've done to fix it? I know we put new chairs in there. I know we put new <coughs> curtains or, or uh, div room dividers in there. Um, we have fixed the doors, outside doors. We've changed the lock on it a couple times. But what else uh, have we done for the integrity of that building? Does anybody here know? What have we done for the roof, the siding? You know, when I asked insulation. him to present, when I asked him to present today, I did not ask him that question. So um, that's not on staff. That's on me. I didn't ask him to ask that question. Councilman Nelson and I were at a meeting where this question was asked, you know, what's the intent? Is your intent to replace the building or repair it? Um, because that will help guide the discussion for the Invest in Wilmer group. And so they had asked us to bring this to the council to see what the council's intent was. And that's why it's in front of us today. So, so. The, the skeleton of the building was brought up. And, and I, I'm sure that it's the integrity there, it's got to be just as strong unless something's rusting inside because it's a metal building and uh, they've got a metal roof. I suspect metal walls. Um, but I, I don't know if we've done a, uh, if that study that was done addressed the inside of those walls or not. I don't know if Sean knows that or if anybody does. But um, I'd like to know what we have done to it, if much of anything. Councilman Palman, followed by Osmus. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, Councilman Christensen brings up some, some good points. Um, just for clarification's sake, is that correct? Do I remember correctly that a group of, of citizens representing the community center did come here mm -hmm. and did uh, they made the claim at the time that they do like the facility in its current location? Um, is that, that was one of their statements, that they prefer that location over all others? About 100 signatures were on that. Yeah, they had a petition that they circulated. Um, and again, you have to remember this was before we had staff out there. So, um, you know, we have staff there now. And so, um, yeah, they were here the same night that Invest in Wilmer was here, right? And they sent us all, all an email probably about 4 o'clock this afternoon, too, so. Um, I think they sent it to everybody. I got it anyways. Mm -hmm. So Okay. Well, I guess that would, um, my mindset would kind of be there too, that if, you know, if the views express that, that they like the location, they're happy with the location, then I think we need to, um, we need to listen to that. But then also Mr. Christensen's points are uh, duly noted and, and well made that, um, you know, deferred maintenance. Uh, and, and for any, you know, say we do decide to build new facilities, uh, in the city of Wilmer, I think it's, um, you know, the past few years, some of the facilities and the costs that we've, um, you know, appropriated to, to fixing some of this deferred maintenance, we really need to pay attention to that and have a plan for that. Um, you know, and that's got to be part of the discussion when we're discussing the new facility itself so that we know, hey, if we do build a new facility, um, what's our plan for ongoing maintenance to make sure to, uh, uh, achieve the maximum lifespan, uh, quality lifespan of these facilities. Um, and I guess the last question that would just remain in my mind then would be, what's the best bang for buck? Um, because, you know, we can, we can take a look at, um, you know, replacing or repairing everything that's deemed uh, or named a deficiency, but at some point you get to a dollar level where um, you know, you're kind of throwing your money at some of the same problems and you got not a whole lot better than what you had before, just kind of the same thing, but it's shiny and new. Um, and so I suppose my, my thought process would just be, okay, what would the price tag be for a extensive renovation compared to a new facility? And if that price tag gets, uh, 
exceedingly high, then then we should start taking a look at a new facility. Because um, newer facilities are more um, you know, energy efficient, uh, cost effective, uh, a lot of the maintenance and whatnot can be improved because building material qualities have improved. So I guess we just got to maybe kind of take a fine tooth comb and go through some of these costs, what it would cost to <coughs> repair, replace versus demolition and rebuild. And um, I'm still open-minded as to both because it's a, it's an important uh, asset to the community here. We just have to uh, make sure we steer the discussion in the right direction and, and weigh out both options. Thanks. Councilman Romanski followed by Osmus. <coughs> Jumped over you, sorry. <clears throat> um, we put this, uh, or allowed it to be put on the local option sales tax, and I think when that discussion was to replace the building, and we put a $2 million price tag on it, because we knew that 1.3 million, that was the replacement cost, that's a few years old now, and that we didn't know what the building, what kind of uses it would have that it currently does not have. And I guess my thought when we put that in that was we would be engaging the public. Um, we have a person on board who would engage the public in what kind of things that building should be used for and we would be replacing it. I share all the concerns that Council Member Christensen just shared. That building is in disrepair and I'm not convinced that the skeleton may not even be in, in it might be in bad shape as well. I don't think we know the answer to that, but that is a, this is a can we've kicked down the road um, a long time. I mean, since I've been the council, uh, we've kicked it down the road, and that was the building that was identified as the building in the worst worst uh, condition that we we have. So we have to address it. I, for me, um, it needed to be right where it's currently sitting, and it probably needs to be replaced. And I thought that's what we were talking about with a local option sales tax. Um, if that does not pass, then we probably need to take a look, because I don't know if we can come up with a, a $2 million budget to, to replace that entire building and that's a bridge we have to cross but I would say at that point we need to really investigate uh, the structure of the building as well because that was not covered in that study that one so that 1.3 replacement um, didn't identify any problems with the actual structure of the building so that'd be something that if we have to address that we need to take a look at the study of the structure of the building but I'm totally in support of uh, the current location where it is at, I think that would made it very clear or something in the proximity it I suppose doesn't have to be in the exact footprint, but somewhere very near there. Um, it was very loud and clear that the people do not want that uh, out at the Civic Center. Uh, that was some of the discussion we had before. So I guess I'm interested in, in sort of the conversation we're having now. I, I think some of those I thought were answered by how we were pursuing this initially with the lo local option sales tax. I thought we were checking that out and that was for replacement of the building. I mean, we were putting $2 million on that um, and the building replacement a couple of years ago for it is how it existed was 1.3. So I thought we had already answered those questions, but I'll again reiterate my support for, for moving forward with the idea that was in that local option sales tax. Yeah, Councilman uh, Meski, just for clarification, the reason that this is in front of us tonight is that the ambiguous uh, nature of the question. And so I called a couple council members and said, what did you hear? And some said, we're going to fix the building. Others said, no, we're going to replace the building. And so I had a meeting with Rob and Britta, and I said, we need to decide what, what was the intent of the council. Was it to replace the building or repair it? And so that's why we're in front of us. And I mean, we're not talking location yet. We're just talking that because they need to know for the meeting on the 10th, are we going to replace the building you're sitting in for this meeting or are we going to repair it? So Councilman Rasmus, good questions. Okay. I was under the impression that the study showed that it was not fiscally responsible to fix what was there. That, that was... I thought they, they gave like a, what, a 55% or something of the cost that it would take. And so that's the part where I, when I say kind of strongly, it doesn't make sense to fix that. I, I compare it to like buying a 1978 Buick and you may love that car, <laughs> and, um, but now the, it's worth a thousand dollars and now the transmission has gone and it's <laughs> rusted and you're going to spend $4,000 on the transmission for that car just because you like the way it rides and you're comfortable with it? That doesn't make sense to me. 
That to me is common sense. So some of the issues that I look at with the present building, as far as even if, if, if we were to fix it, I have, I have ADA issues with going up into the where you, it was built as a bar to go up into where to play pool. There's steps to go into the exercise room. It's not accessible to somebody to go down those steps. I think we can, we can build something better for our seniors that is more accessible for them. And, um, and I totally understand that they, um, that they like that location and that definitely um, would be part of the conversation. Um, one of the issues I have with that location is they can't turn left coming out onto um, 71. A lot of them will go out the back way to, like you said, High Avenue to go to Lakeland Drive because that's just a safer <coughs> exit. If they're going up north, they're going to Spicer. If they live up north, then it's easier for them to take a right turn. But it is, um, there's a lot of traffic moving at 55 miles an hour for them to take a left out of there. That's a consideration for safety that, um, that I think about. Um, when the people came in with the 100 signatures, I think a lot of that was driven by the initial talk about the local option sales tax and talk that it was going out to the Civic Center. Um, that was kind of thrown out as an idea, as a possibility. They came across loud and clear. They did not want um, the community center out there. So that, 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 was, uh, that was made loud and clear. Um, the other issue I have is part of the, the remodeling or what we could have in a facility is that kitchen um, isn't really set up. I mean, it doesn't even have a stove. It doesn't have an oven. Um, so basically, it's a place to store plates and silverware uh, and a dishwasher. Um, that, that has to be improved, to be able to have meetings out there and community events. Um, all of that stuff can be improved with, uh, with, with a new building. It isn't a matter of, ooh, building new because we want shiny and new. It's, it's needed. That, that building is tired. That building is old. And we deserve it to the citizens to have something that's in better shape than that. Um, I think historically, we're gonna find that there hasn't been a lot of money spent on maintenance. Um, we look around our different uh, structures and I think we'll see that we're, um, we've, we've been short on that. With that being said, this gives us an opportunity when we build something new to have it in the plans with the engineers, with them outlining the annual, semi-annual, biannual maintenance going forward. So we can, uh, and ex like uh, Councilman uh, Palman said, extend the life of these buildings for greater than uh, 40 years or 50 years. We want to uh, maintain what we have and, and get in the habit of doing that. In Wilmer, um, we can do that and we should be doing that. People like to cook and they like to get together. And like, like uh, Councilor Osma said, we need to um, have a, a, an area where many uh, community members can get together, share their fare as far as food, like we've had the Somalian community uh, there, and they bring in food and, and, and that sort of thing. And it's wonderful, but it would be nice if they could keep it in warming trays or whatever they had to do so that it's, um, everything is compliant um, with the uh, health code. Um, it, I think Julie said it nicely. It's, it's outlived its usefulness. It hasn't been uh, taken care of. It's been Band-Aid. Um, we know what we have to do. Uh, if we get a new facility, which I would hope we would, how to maintain it. And I think um, that's what we have to do. That has to be part of our plan to build it and then maintain it and not drop the ball, not drop the ball. Um, if, if there's a a 10-year plan, 20-year plan, whatever it is, that we, we maintain the building. And um, I think we should be able to do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Councilmember Fagerly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> the people have spoken. They want the community center where it's at. So I was thinking it was steel beamed. And if it is, I would just strip it all down and start new. Building codes, as uh, Councilman Christensen stated, has changed. And you'd have to reinforce uh, a roof with more steel beam or a header. And I would build there uh, that way. And if it isn't steel beam, then I would just demolish it and start fresh at that location. Because so, I'm afraid the walls and ceilings are full of mold with all the water intrusion. So. Councilman Nelson. I just ask, I'm thinking about that document. Um, it might be helpful for it to be added to our minutes so that people who are listening to us or people who are concerned can understand the information that we received regarding the amount of repairs and, and the, some of the structural things with the building. So I know that there was a lot of time and energy put into that, and I know it's a couple of years old, but I think it does reflect, and we haven't done anything, I don't think, to the building since then. So. I just that, ask that that be made available. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? you haven't said too much yet, so I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Okay. You've been out there now for six weeks? About, I think. Okay. And so what are you seeing on use? I mean, when, when the building was originally taken over by the city, it was taken over as a senior center, mm -hmm. and that use has dramatically changed, um, and now it's a community center, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are you seeing as far as uses? Are you seeing uh, nights and weekends and all hours of the day? I mean, I know the seniors are out there. They're playing cards. They're uh, exercising. They're walking. They've got the garden in the back. They have all that stuff. But really what the goal was by the council, I think probably three years ago, was to change the vision of that complex from a senior center to a community center. Um, so how do you see that? in places where you've been before how does it compare um, you know we have somebody with new ideas here because that's why we hired you because you got a lot of great ideas so let's hear what you have to say um in my time being here i've seen a lot of seniors obviously being using of the building they have dances music um we've also had um, group homes come in and play pool play cards play games i've seen some of those um I've also been keeping track of where people are coming from. So we have people coming from Belgrade, from Watkins, from Spicer, New London. So we're getting not just Wilmer residents, we're getting drawing in a lot of other communities. Um, I've also been seeing some families come in. They've been um, reading books, looking at the children's. So we have a little children's nook. Um, I think that could also use some improvements, but um, yeah, so it's, a little bit more still on the senior side of usage, but I think it has a lot of potential if we can do some updates to the building and make it more community friendly. And so, and then when, when, when you and I talked last week, um, you know, your, your vision for this is really a community driven vision, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it isn't that you're, you're expecting to walk in and tell the council, do this, this, and this. No. I mean, your goal is to go and solicit input, have conversations one-on-one -on -one or group or something like that. that that's kind of what you shared with me when yep. we visited, but I mean, is that kind of the vision you have? Yeah, totally. hundred percent. Um, I think it, right, it needs to be the whole community center. Everyone should be having their input on what they want to see come from that building. Like, it should be accessible to everyone who uses it, so we need to make it make it user-friendly for everyone that is using it. You know, I was over at Bethesda for a meeting. Um, uh, when was this? Probably within the last two weeks. And they have that thing in the floor for the kids to play on. And they move that around. I don't know if you guys have been over and seen that yet, but that thing is just so cool. And it's an interactive thing with both the elderly people and with the younger That's people. Awesome. And it, it's just a tremendous tool. And, you know, those are some of the out of the box things we could think about. And so, um, yeah, I, so exciting. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> Councilmember Maskey. <clears throat> I was wondering, Britt, if you could expand a little bit on, you said, well, if I could, if we could do these types of additive things, we could do these kind of direction. If you could expand on what, sure. you, what some of those things might be. Like um, Julie had said that there's no kitchen. 
there's no one can cook anything, so you can't do any baking there. You can't do bring in a party and have those container uh, warming trays to keep things looking nice and presentable. If you're having a 50th anniversary party there, it has to be crock pots and those trays. So I think if we could upgrade the kitchen in that regard, that would be awesome. There's no real art supplies. You can't really do any art, creative art programs or um, painting type of things, crafts. Um, the exercise equipment is very limited. There's just the two treadmills and two really outdated bikes. So seeing that updated would be awesome to get a more user-friendly seniors, kids, whichever age group equipment out there where they could learn and do these kinds of things as a family even. Um, another one would be the wood shop. We have the wood shop out there. I don't think a lot of people even know that exists. So getting a group, I'm trying to promote a group that's going out there right now. So hopefully getting just more people engaged and knowing that it's accessible to do something, but bring your family with too and also be, make it a family center instead of just a community center. Thank you. And I also want to say, I think it's really nice that you've done the study of where people are coming from. It makes me feel a lot more confident that we put this as a local option sales tax issue because that really speaks to what you do with those projects. This is talking about not just Wilmer, this is a surrounding community. So right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Council Mayor Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could you maybe um, elaborate on who uses the facility currently? I know there's a, uh, the men's choir, the barbershop quartet, yep. drum circles. Um, I've heard that there's a bingo, a Mexican bingo on Friday nights or something. What are some of the community uses of that building? So like you had mentioned, we have um, the choir group. We have um, community ed programs that are taking place out there. We have Ramaz that just finished up. Um, we have bone builders exercise class that takes place out there. Um, there's the weekly senior club entertainment, weekly meetings. We have um, Medicare programs for seniors, aging wisely groups for seniors also. Um, every day we serve lunch, Monday through Friday, um, through Lutheran Social <coughs> Services. Um, what else? Quilters. Quilters, thank you. Quilting group that takes place pretty much throughout the whole month. Um, the dance, uh, yeah, Monday and mm -hmm. But Wednesdays and Fridays, they have a dance out there for the seniors as well. Um, Different music lessons. Accordion. Accordions, um, violin. Yep. Piano. Um, yeah. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is that um, the age group is from newborn to seniors, mm -hmm. pretty much. Right now, yeah. Okay. And you would hopefully expand that with um, different ideas that you and the mayor like have spoken of. Right, and like I said, with some of those updates we could do, programming could just expand upon that with different groups, different age levels, um, more communities, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Rob, could you share a little bit what we had talked about, about the outdoor activities? Yeah, right now we're kind of, we're kind of landlocked about what we can do outside um, in that center just because of the highway there and then the high avenue behind um, really the only outdoor space that we got right now is for the garden space um, otherwise we can't do any outdoor activities as with families that we would want to get into I know Brent and I talked about some of the things that we could do as family programming but we're kind of landlocked at the senior center or at the community center one thing I like to add too about with the building itself it's not really set up for us to have a lot of programming in that building right now um, just because of the dividers if we're having a drumming class going on then we put a divider on that's going to disrupt the next group that's next to them if we're trying to hold another meeting um, when i was doing the facility scheduling with the school we would never have a meeting space for people to go to that are 25 to 30. now it's really hard for us to find a place like that besides a classroom and if you've ever tried to sit in a middle school desk it's not very comfortable or you're sitting at a cafeteria on the round circles those aren't very comfortable to sit after in a half an hour so we need to have those type of facilities out there um, then we also have to have it so we can hold 75 to 100 people as well and we don't have that right now 
I don't think that the community center is set up that way for us to host those type of events. And some of the goals that Britt and I have is to bring those type of programming ideas to the community center. Councilman Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now you speak of family activities. We've got Robbins Island Park, or Robbins Island right across the road from there. Um, I, I look at that as a place for family outdoor activities. And it seems to me uh, that we're leaning toward building, and I'm not totally opposed to that, but let's see what underneath the skin of this thing, just taking the steel off. But it seems we're trying to be everything to everybody here, you know, from dance to drum to, to pool to whatever. I mean, you know, we have other facilities in town, including the Y, that, that a lot of seniors go there. Um, we've got Bethesda. Um, we've got Rice Care. I mean, there's places where they go to exercise. That we don't have to be all of that to everybody but we do need a transition to a community center because the senior center has gone from it was almost 400 people that uh, belong to it down to about 100 150 i think presently so it needs to transition to more of a community uh, center for uh, families or their drum lines but keep in mind we can't be everything to everybody folks we can't do that that's not what government's for we're here to service the people, but it's mostly streets, curb gutter, lights, sewer, water, things like that. So you, you have a lot of great ideas, but we cannot be everything to everybody. You know, you can get a schedule out there for drum line or dancing, or I think the seniors use it more today than, than the community in general. Uh, and the people who come from out of town, I think are seniors, if I'm not mistaken, they come here because it's a nice facility and they, it's, it's a place to meet friends and socialize. Uh, uh, I go out and, and entertain once in a while with my son. He sings out there once every couple months, and I go over there and help him out. So I know a lot of these people, and I'm a senior. Um, and this transition we're making is because a lot of people my age, or seniors today, young senior, I guess I'd call it, don't use that facility. Uh, the average seniors out there, I, gotta, I think they're 75 plus. And it used to be early 60s to 80s that were out there. But, so there is this transition we're going through. There's, there's so much to do today for people my age, uh, whether it's in Wilmer, St. Cloud, the cities. There's a lot to do in Wilmer that doesn't include going out to the senior center and playing cards or, uh, or the music entertainment. So let's not try to be everything to everybody. Um, you know, set up five, six, seven, eight, ten programs and limit it to that and, and, and work hard on it because well, you can spread your wings so far and you just pretty soon you're not doing the job um, if you're trying to do everything. Um, those are just a few of my comments and uh, you can chew on and spit out or think about them. <laughs> yes. Besides uh, Robbins Island across the highway, you got Memorial Park mm -hmm. to the west, <clears throat> big open area there if you need some space. Tennis courts. And then you got the tennis courts. So. There's options for you. you. Might have to walk, you know, a block or two, but be safer going west than crossing the highway unless you start at Robbins Island. That's where you all meet. So you got options there. Council uh, Member oh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to uh, kind of pick uh, uh, our administrator's uh, mind and ask him about, you know, you've traveled in a lot of. Uh, cities and towns and, and worked in different communities what would you um, what what have you seen that works in a community center um, what are some of the successes that you could share that you've seen that not just not just down at uh, Chillicothe but wherever you've been I think that um, the key is to remain focused and I agree with council member Christensen that we can't be everything to everyone. And so that during the course of this discussion, uh, we look at the services that uh, are requested by the community. And we focus strictly on those. And some of the better uh, community centers that I've seen um, have focused in on seniors during the day and more of community events in the evening. Uh, also child care, we've talked about you know, the need for child care in this community, and sometimes a community center can be an assistance to that. Um, so I think that 
the biggest success I've seen is that they remain focused uh, on what the citizens want. And I've seen some outstanding senior uh, centers where meals were served and hundreds of people would come there during the day. And we're very satisfied with uh, everything from the dance classes to uh, the games to the meals and the transportation to and from. And then vice, and also in that same line, uh, the, the, uh, the area was made available for uh, events for people's anniversaries and uh, birthdays and such at a reasonable <laughs> cost. And so I think those are some things that I think that uh, staff is online that we're going to reach out to the community and to the users right now and see, you know, what do they want? And then we got to obviously look at cost to make sure that we can afford to do that. But I think we have an excellent opportunity here uh, to gather that information and, and build something that would be, uh, you know, very uh, utilized in the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, if I were to surmise and counsel tell me if I'm uh, getting this wrong, but we're leaning more towards a new building uh, and the people that are thinking of remodeling would want to see what the inside of it looks like first before making that decision. So is that is that a correct analysis of what I heard? Well, I don't know about that. The inside comment, I think what we're hearing is that if the actual steel framework is salvageable, that those folks were talking about that part being the same. But Yeah, I was that's what I was talking about. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. And I had three, I heard three people have that in their comments that they were concerned about that. That's what I had. So um, <coughs> go forth and try to make some wisdom out of it. So thank you. You, you now have the... You have a, a wide range of conversations here. So, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Britta and uh, um, Rob, for your presentation. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, the Community Development Committee, Councilmember uh, Fagerly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Bruce Peterson called me and said there's a developer that's wishing to build some apartments in town, and he's looking at a TIF district. So, Mr. Peterson. Mayor, members of the council, the city has received an application for tax increment financing assistance from Samuel Herzog of JHLLC. His proposal is to develop four 72-unit buildings over a four-year period. The project would include 120 garage stalls and is planned for a site of approximately 15 acres on North County Road 5. The developer anticipates constructing one unit or one 72 unit building each year for four years beginning in 2019, depending on the market. Um, if the TIF process proceeds, annexation and land use approvals will be sought concurrently with the TIF review. I think we're all aware that there's an ongoing shortage of workforce housing in the city. Despite the recent housing construction activity, which has been uh, a pleasant surprise, a serious shortage remains, and we hear all the time that it impacts the ability of businesses to recruit and retain employees. We have a developer that stepped forward and has a proposal to help alleviate some of the housing shortage. In order to do so, TIF is a key part of financing the overall project. You will recall that the TIF plan would require a public hearing and we are also required to notify the county and school district and uh, explain the financial implications of the proposal on each taxing jurisdiction. The, there we go. the ongoing issue with the use of TIF is that a lot of people would say it gives an unfair advantage to certain developers um, in a multifamily market such as Wilmer, it's virtually impossible to build multifamily units without some level of assistance. And the assistance is typically there as an inducement for the developer to do the project. I mean, it's the developer cannot afford to do these projects as charity projects. There is a return expected on the project and tax increment financing definitely anticipates that there is a return on that project. 
The total value of this project at build out as estimated by the county is approximately $28 million. And uh, that, was, that estimate was provided by the county assessor's office. The city portion of taxes generated by the first phase of the project will be approximately 33,800 for the first building in real estate with a slightly lesser amount for additional buildings. The impact on the county would be roughly $52,500 for the first building and these are annual impacts, not total impacts. Uh, and the impact on the school district would be approximately 33,000 for the uh, if the voter levy is included. The numbers that are uh, my tablet. The numbers that you were given paint a really interesting picture for this project. It shows that there is a tremendous amount of investment required to do it, and the tax increment that would be generated over the life of this district um, would help offset some of that developer risk. The developer has requested that tax increment financing be uh, provided to the maximum amount available by statute for a period of 15 years per building. That would result in a total district length of 18 years because uh, the first building would be on for 15 and then the second one would be on for years two through 16, et cetera. And um, that way we can uh, maximize the use of TIF into this project. and. Demand will ultimately determine what the end result is, and that's why we would look at doing a development agreement for this project and writing four separate TIF notes, one as each building is developed. Um, the developer is here tonight to talk about the project, as is uh, Aaron Backman from the EDC and uh, Todd from Ehlers Associates, who's run some numbers for us. It is my ask that the matter after, at the conclusion of discussion gets moved ahead to the full council meeting and that we can set a uh, hearing for the TIF plan for December 3rd. Your council report says November 19th, but uh, we're going to request an extra two weeks to get all our paperwork done and have the hearing on December 3rd instead should the council decide to move with the project. Um, I would like to have Mr. Herzog come forward and present additional information to the council and then I believe Mr. Backman is also prepared to speak and we can all address questions as they come up. Thank you. Mr. Herzog. Thank you, uh, council, mayor, for the opportunity to be here tonight. My name is Samuel Herzog and uh, our uh, development company is Unique Opportunities. Uh, the LLC we'll be using is JH LLC should we move forward with the development in Wilmer. My partner uh, is Troy Johnson. He's the contractor that will be involved uh, should we move forward. Uh, and He's with me tonight if there's any questions about uh, the actual building of the buildings. Uh, we've been in partnership for about five years and have done developments in six communities in uh, what would be considered outstate Minnesota. Um, we're also actively uh, starting new developments in other communities as well, um, which is one of the reasons we're here tonight. Um, some of the communities have a lot of similarities to Wilmer, uh, such as Fergus Falls, Alexandria, Marshall, and Detroit Lakes that we've been doing developments in. Um, and in each of these communities, TIF has become a necessary component of project feasibility because without it, there is not enough of a cash flow return for the banks to lend the money that is needed for the projects to happen. Uh, we'll come into the projects with a 20% down payment um, with the expectation that the bank is going to uh, finance the remainder. Um, however, there's just not enough profitability in these projects. So usually they're coming in with around 70% and then TIF uh, is that other component uh, that, will, that, that is necessary for the projects to happen. Um, we're here tonight in Wilmer because Wilmer has a lot of things um, that have been happening that are very positive. It's had a lot of development um, and there's been a lot of job creation uh, from my communication uh, with Aaron in the community and there's an expectation that's going to continue to happen as we move forward and uh, I think I think that's fantastic. Uh, what's surprising to me as a multifamily developer is how little market rate multifamily development there has been in Wilmer especially for the size you know of the communities we've developed Wilmer would actually be the largest by total population with a lot of the other communities in closer to the 13,000 uh, population range and in each of those communities over the past 
last five years, with the exception of Marshall, uh, Detroit Lakes, Fergus Falls, Alexandria, they've all seen hundreds of units uh, come online with the assistance of TIF. But, uh, and TIF has a component where typically 20% of the units um, have a, uh, they have to be a low income that is uh, measured at 50% of median income. But the other 80% are typically a working class or, or a non-restricted rent rate uh, type uh, unit. And these other communities have uh, been able to continue to grow their housing market by adding that. And I think that Wilmer is at a point in time where the vacancy rate is so low. My dad actually uh, uh, owned some apartments in Wilmer, and they've, they've been 100% full um, for as long as he had them. And there is essentially um, r really a, a very little, close to zero vacancy rate in the community. And uh, there's not a lot of options if you're not in a low income position. You guys have had some fantastic new um, lower income developments uh, you know, through some developers recently. Um, and I believe the 15th Street Flats is one of them. And I, I know there's some others that are in process as well. And uh, there's just not a lot of options if you're working um, you know, in your guys' newer technology park that is just, uh, it's very cool to see a community have something like that. But there's not a lot of options if you're making you know, $40,000 a year. Maybe you're not ready to buy a house yet uh, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe you're just moving to the community, taking a job, and you want to see how it goes before you actually set down roots permanently. There's not a lot of newer units that have a lot of the amenities that these type of people are looking for. Um, the millennial generation is a younger generation, and a lot of them, their first desire isn't necessarily home ownership as some of the previous generations. They want amenities, they want something nice that's comfortable, and the, the units that we're going to be building are going to have a level of those amenities. Now, they're not going to be luxury units, but they're going to have stainless steel appliances. They're going to have a washer and dryer in every unit. Uh, a lot of them will have nice uh, balconies. You know, they'll have uh, garages with garage door openers. A lot of things that, you know, houses would provide those amenities, but a lot of apartments, um, especially uh, the ones that are in Wilmer, are, were built in the 80s. They don't have things like those nicer appliances. They haven't been updated. Most of them don't have laundry in the units. And those things are key components to reaching um, a lot of the workforce that the businesses in Wilmer need to grow. Um, so so that's, a, that's a reason why we're here tonight. Um, looking specifically at the project, we looked at several different pieces of land, um, working uh, both with uh, Aaron as well as a, a couple different local real estate agents. Um, there was a couple other projects that or properties that we tried to uh, work out a deal on, but we're just not able to uh, come to an agreement. Um, and now we're purchasing what's part of the Thorpe Farm um, that is on County Road 5 out there. We're, we have a contract, uh, assuming we're able to move forward with all the approvals we need um, on the city uh, council level uh, to purchase 15 acres. So uh, the density, even though there's a lot of units, these buildings will be spread out over 15 acres. So it's not going to feel like it's incredibly compact as it might if you were in St. Cloud, Minneapolis, or Fargo. They're not going to have that same density, even though these are large buildings, if that makes sense. So uh, we're, we're looking at um, doing our first building in 2019. It would be a 72-unit building. And I feel like uh, looking at the market, uh, four buildings over four years is very achievable. Um, and I think that, honestly, the community will absorb it. And I think it will help um, increase some of the uh, job growth as well because it will bring in some new people that are, that are willing to take those jobs as oftentimes housing is a reason that is cited for people not being willing to move to a community quickly. So I'm, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or uh, comments that any of you guys have. And I know um, uh, Todd uh, from Ellers, um, who is your guys' consultant, has looked at our numbers. I'm sure one of the questions that all of you will ask is, is TIF really needed? Is this an, another developer that's trying to get rich that uh, you know just wants to <coughs> basically take as much as he can? And I can say no all day long, but obviously I think your guys' consultant can um, look at the project numbers, uh, look at whether they're actually feasible, and uh, give you guys a lot more input there. Um, you know, I can tell you without TIF, this project won't happen. So yes, you're giving us a significant, um, you know, a, a significant tax advantage through TIF. However, if the buildings aren't built, there's really no money to give us. So I, I feel like there, that's that's one of the really important selling points of TIF, um, and, and I think that's why it makes sense from the city's perspective to move forward. Um, I'd be uh, happy to entertain any questions now. I think maybe we'll save the questions until after Aaron has presented. Sounds perfect. So if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Aaron? 
Aaron Backman, uh, EDC Executive Director. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, I'm pleased that uh, Samuel and Troy are, are here tonight. Uh, they are an experienced housing developer team. They have developed tens of millions of dollars of housing in Greater Minnesota, including the Rosewood Apartments in Alexandria, that's 180 units. Uh, the Legion Field Apartments in Marshall, 108 units. The Legacy Trail in Fergus, 36 units and others. Mr. Herzog is proposing a nearly $30 million investment in this community. And this would be on the northwest side of town, not that far away from the Wichita College uh, area. You know, in my discussions with uh, Dr. Johnson, he was excited about the possibility of more housing closer to the college. Bigger picture. Over the, ten, the last 10 years, Alexandria, the city of Alexandria, has developed six, between 600 and 700 multifamily units. They were constructed primarily with TIF. How many multifamily units were constructed in Wilmer during that same time? Zero. Zero. Excluding basically senior housing, and now we have 47 units under construction with 15 street flats. And that was including some TIF that made that happen. So I would encourage the council to consider the, this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you, Aaron. Aaron, was uh, financial gonna speak or just if there's questions? Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Todd Hagan from Ellers and Associates. Um, uh, the city, uh, uh, Bruce had, had uh, tasked me with uh, preparing the tax increment numbers. I took a look at their um, project performa. Uh, we do that at our office as well, but have not been instructed to go through it with a fine tooth comb, did a kind of a brush stroke with it um, and with Aaron. Um, you looked at the taxes, the property tax they had listed in there um, as far as what would need to be paid per year, and that appears to be accurate, as accurate as we can kind of estimate at, at the moment with the uh, estimated market value of the project. Um, and it looks uh, to us that it, it's infeasible without TIF. Um, there's a rate of return uh, that looks um, uh, about the same as uh, what the property taxes would be spent. So it's kind of a wash that way, right? So you kind of relieve them a little bit, redirect the ta taxes um, per year, and it kind of actually comes back to the developer and more of kind of a um, profit that way. So it, uh, it looks like it's in keeping with, with that as well. Yeah, we did the numbers, um, sent them to Bruce. Um, that's where he got some of those, those numbers from as well. Um, so we can, we, can go th we can go through um, a more extensive uh, look at the project performa. Uh, we can even talk about look back provisions when it comes time to actually cut the deal with the developer. Um, as far as the public hearing in December, um, you, know, you can go through that, right, and kind of get the tax increment uh, district established if that's what you'd like to do. And then the actual deal comes when we look at the development agreement, obviously come back to the council uh, to see exactly how much you want to ratchet that down. If 15 years looks fine, you know, 18 on all four buildings, and to take a look at their rate of return and things like that through our kind of perform more in-depth perform analysis, but right now on its face, it looks like it's um, proved up to this point as far as we can tell. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Herzog, it's a pleasure to see a project come in front of the council. Um, just last week, I talked to a school teacher who accepted a job at our new Lakeland Elementary, tried to find housing in Wilmer and had to locate in, in uh, Olivia. Olivia was the closest place she could find housing. Uh, I know of a young family who wanted to, had accepted a job in Wilmer, um, and uh, I was trying to find housing for them. I called Councilmember Christensen, hoping he would have something, and uh, the two of us exhausted our list, and we finally found something, uh, but they ended up finding a home on their own uh, on the open market. Um, this was a family that may not have came to Wilmer because they couldn't find housing. Um, you know. Businesses in Wilmer tell me on a regular basis that they cannot expand because there's no housing here. I think the numbers that Aaron shared with us are glaring. Uh, 10 years, we haven't had a, had, a, had a multifamily housing project. Why is that? I think we all know what the reason is and we're here to change that. So council, uh, 
Comments, Councilmember Fagley? I got a few questions, Mr. Herzog. So 72 units per building? That's correct. So how many one bedroom, two bedrooms? Yeah, right now, you know, and as the projects are developed, you know, we'll build the first building and then we'll probably come back in front of council should there be any significant changes, um, you know, to unit structure, things like that, because sometimes we'll see demand in areas that we're not anticipating. But for the first building, we're looking at doing two four bedroom units, 10 three bedroom units, 36 two bedroom units, and 24 one bedroom units. Would you repeat that again? Yes, uh, two four bedroom units, 10 three bedroom units, 36 two bedroom units, and 24 one bedroom units. And this, you call it workforce housing. No section eight then? No, no section eight. Um, as a component of TIF, 20% of the units will have to be rented to 50% of median income. For a family of four, that's probably going to be right around $40,000 a year. Um, we'll get the exact numbers, obviously, in the final agreements, but it's going to be right in that range there. Um, so 20% of the units will have, we will rent and we'll have to do annually, certif annually certify that that's the case. Um, but what we're going to anticipate doing is trying to keep the rent prices as, as obviously, as low as we're able to because that's in everybody's best interest. We keep the units more full and they're more affordable. So we're targeting that mid $800 range for our two bedroom apartments. Um, that's oftentimes that two bedroom is what you'll see as a comparison, you know, for other communities. Um, you know, some communities are a little bit lower. You know, Fergus Falls and Detroit Lakes are a little bit less than that. Um, Alexandria is a little bit more than that. That's the exact number we're at in Marshall. So I feel like from a community perspective, when I look at a lot of the older units, they're in that 650, um, 675 range. And typically we're going to get uh, about 20 to 25% more for a new unit because there's laundry in unit because it's updated, those types of things. So I feel like that's a very attainable rate. It's also fairly affordable. Um, if a person is coming in, um, even if it's a single person that wants a one bedroom apartment, I think uh, we're anticipating our one bedroom apartments at about seven twenty five. Uh, if a single person is making fifteen dollars an hour, they're going to make about thirty thousand dollars a year. You know, so thirty percent of their income is nine thousand dollars a year, which is typically um, the mark that people that, that we want to see is people not spending more than thirty percent of their income on housing, and they would be able to afford a one bedroom apartment with a fifteen dollar an hour job. And there's a lot of places in Wilmer hiring at fifteen dollars an hour right now. So I feel like. Um, this is something that uh, will be achievable to, to most people in that workforce uh, demographic. And we'll also see, you know, with some of the larger units, we'll see families, um, you know, coming to the community. Um, in Alexandria, we just opened a building that was uh, six four bedroom and six three bedroom units. So with those larger units there, we've been able to see a lot more of those families relocate. And, and I think from a community perspective, there's a lot of positives because that brings more students into the school district. That brings typically two jobs. Um, you know, two people that are going to be able to work jobs. And uh, it's, it's a lot more, you know, that having that whole family unit's a positive to a community. So I think that's why some of the larger units um, will see that. And in future buildings, should we get a really good response in the larger units, we'll probably add more of the three and four bedroom units as well. And garages, do you have to pay extra? Yeah, that's that's a structure we've gone with. Um, you know, we we're close. We're out of Fergus Falls, so we're close to the Faru area. And and I've had a, I've had a lot of experience working with some of the developers there, even though we have not built in Fargo. And they've taken the approach of building a garage for everyone. And we've kind of gone the other direction because what I've found is less than half of the people actually want that garage space. Um, you know, often you know because it's not heated, it's. 40 yards from the building typically, and they can find a parking spot that's closer. And cars don't have the same issues they may have had 30 years ago where they're just not going to start if they're not in the garage. So a lot of them would just rather park closer to the building and walk in. And what we've done is we've just made the garages nicer. Most apartment complexes don't install their own openers and have we have the keyless entry and those type of things for all of our garages. So we've set it up. We build them a little bit bigger too so you can actually get a full-size truck in them. So it's something where the people that want them, it's going to be nice, it's going to be usable for everything that they want, and the people that don't want to uh, have one aren't going to see it reflected in their rent. So we're not going to make it an across the board. So we typically see about a third of the tenants um, that are willing to, to pay for that and that uh, desire to that level. So you plan on <clears throat> keeping the property or owning it? Yes. Um, we are a develop and long-term hold. Um, that's our, our business strategy. Um, so we're going to come in, we're going to build it, and we are going to own it for the foreseeable future. We don't 
there, there's no plan to sell. This isn't a 10 years, we're going to hold it and then we're going to you know, liquidate and pull our money out of it. Um, we anticipate being here for the, for the long haul. You know, once these four buildings are built, um, we want to see what else um, you know, needs to be done you know, in Wilmer. There's a property by uh, the uh, Copperfield Landing, I believe is the name of it. There's that corner piece of property, and we tried to negotiate on that. But we'd love to do uh, you know, on, on a site like that, uh, or potentially that site, um, a building with underground parking. Um, that's a huge thing that uh, people really like right now. Um, so, you know, there's future developments we'd like to do, and we'd like to partner with the community long term to do some of those. But right now, what we want to, you know, we want to look at these first four. Um, we need to prove ourselves as developers to you. You need to make sure the buildings look nice, that you get positive feedback from the community, and uh, obviously, we need to make sure the city is going to support us um, to be able to do those this initial building right away uh, as well. But uh, we anticipate a, a long term relationship. So before you got into this, were you in sales? <laughs> I grew up on a strawberry and raspberry uh, farm. So yes, I was at uh, all, all summer long during the strawberry raspberry season. I was selling my flats of fresh picked strawberries. So I did sales. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Hi. Audrey? Just looking at the site plan, I wondered if you could just address some of the common space in the building or amenities. Yep. And then um, the drawing that you have, it says pond park walking trails. Just to, um, Yep. The, the pond is a requirement um, of the uh, MPCA, I believe. Um, MPCA? MPCA. MPCA, yeah. Okay, we're good. Um, so basically any impervious surface that we add, that's parking lots, that's the building, we have to make sure that we have enough storage for a 100-year rain event um, should there be a significant amount of water so that it wouldn't um, you know, flood the city's uh, um, stormwater uh, drains, basically. So that's what the pond is. There, uh, we're, we're kind of in the initial stages of the development here. Over the next few months, um, there's a few different ways it can be developed. It may hold water. It may not hold water all the time. We'll just have to see. Um, but yes, in the buildings themselves, there'll be an elevator in every building. Um, there'll be a community room um, in some of the buildings. There'll be workout rooms in other of the buildings. When you do four buildings, our experience has been um, and uh, I've managed a lot of complexes that are older too. We don't have very many projects that we've done for buildings. In fact, our, our largest project, we only have three buildings on right now. We have phases to build our fourth and fifth buildings. Um, but what we've seen is uh, there, if you have the same community room in each building, they're not necessarily used that much. So you can do a community room in one, you can do a workout room in another, and you, you would do share amenity access. So if it's in one of the buildings, any people from all four of the buildings could use that. So we do a nice community room in one, you do a nice office in another, you do a nice uh, workout room. Um, one of the things that we're looking at doing right now, um, we're trying it right now on a building that's, uh, it'll be finished next May in Alexandria, but we're doing a shared third story balcony with built-in grills and stuff. So that's something that we're going to look to see if would be feasible um, for this project as well. Um, so we're, we're looking at having some amenities like that. Um, there won't be any laundry amenities or anything like that because those will all be in unit. Um, we also make sure we have really large hallways. Uh, a lot of the older apartment buildings, it's very difficult to move larger furniture in and out. So we try to make our stairwells and hallways um, really work well uh, for, for that aspect. From the outside of the buildings, um, we'll put in at least one playground, probably two for the property. Um, there is the advantage of this site that we're very close to a city park. Do you know what park that is called? Boss. Boss. No. Boss? No. no. There's another one. The church. It's, it's literally touching. The, mm -hmm. the property borders this other park. So that's a huge advantage to having um, uh, this specific space as well, um, is having that uh, area. But walking trails, um, regardless of whether we do a balcony, we'll have built-in grills for people to use outside, um, things like that. Um, the walking trails, um, and uh, we'll probably put in some type of a, uh, a dog park um, with dog refuse containers and stuff like that. Um, a huge component of the people in this workforce uh, housing, a lot of them have pets. And, you know, there's two approaches you can take. You have a lot of landlords that are going to be like, you know, we just don't want to see pets in here. And with some of the new emotional support requirements from uh, the state, it's very difficult to say you can't bring any pets in our buildings because they can get doctor's notes and you, and you really can't say no from a legal perspective. So we've gone the other direction and we've said, here's the deal. We're going to embrace pets. You might have to pay a $200 deposit or something like that. 
but we're going to try to build our buildings where a bunch of the units are pet friendly. So we have a lot of our units, we'll put in waterproof um, LVT and LVP flooring um, that's specifically designed to be odor resistant and, and waterproof so that pets can't damage it as much. So oftentimes we'll see a third of our units have some type of a, a cat or a dog. We do have breed restrictions and weight restrictions, typically at about 40 or 50 pounds um, is the largest you can have a dog. But it allows a lot of people to make that place more of a home because for a lot of people, having a pet's a huge part of their life. So we try to be as inclusive as possible in, in letting people live um, in their home in whatever way is most comfortable to them. Thank you. Fernando? Thank you. Um, what about your management team? Yeah. Uh, can you tell me how they're managed on a daily basis? I can. Okay. I own the management company, so that's why I can tell you. Um, I actually, I started the management company several years ago, um, right when we were starting this company, because one of the things I'd seen in a lot of new buildings, I had some relatives who had been a part of building projects, not from an actual involvement, but just from a financial perspective. And they always, you know, at, at Deer Camp every year, they would talk about how much they hated the management company. It was kind of, you know, the joke that went around. So my perspective going into it was there's got to be a better way to do this. And I'm not going to say we're perfect by any means, but I'm involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the management company my office is in my management company's um, building and we try to do as good a job as possible we're going to have when we come in here um, when all four buildings are built we'll have two full-time managers that work there full-time so in one of the buildings there'll be an office it'll probably have three offices um, you know in a reception area so we'll staff that um, during normal business hours we'll have emergency uh, staff here so if there's a call in the middle of the night we can actually send somebody out so we have a 24-hour emergency line um, that we answer at any point day or night so that's that's a huge relief to a lot of people coming in because if you have an issue in the middle of the night you, you want to be able to call somebody other than you know the police or the fire department if it's a water leak so we're, we provide that service um, we provide a lot of uh, um, I, I'm a little bit younger, and uh, I have a lot of the uh, technology experience um, through college and uh, some friends that I have, and I had a lot of them uh, help us design websites, help us design online tenant portals. So you'll get an account um, being a tenant with us. You'll be able to do everything online from paying your rent to, you know, if you have a complaint or anything like that. And we try to streamline that process and handle it. And we also reach a lot of that younger workforce demographic because we do a lot of social media advertising. When we have vacant units, they'll be um, on all the different online sources from Facebook, Craigslist, Twitter, all those different uh, spots you'll see advertisements for our units. So um, while we definitely ha are also advertising in, on the radio, you know, newspaper, the more traditional avenues of advertising, we also take advantage of some of the newer forms, um, and that definitely uh, is what a lot of people that are younger and are looking to be in the community are going to use to find their place. What's the name of your management company? Herzog Property Management, LLC. So you don't have uh, managers on site that live there? Uh, yes, typically. Um, so we, we take a, a dual approach. What we do is we hire a manager that's responsible for the cleaning. You know, on a building like this, they're probably going to get about a $500 deduction uh, a month in their rent. Um, so they'll pay, if they're in a two-bedroom, they'll probably pay $350 to live there. And they'll be responsible for cleaning the hallways once a week, which will probably take about four or five hours a week. But having them there is, is just kind of that... It kind of gives us a little bit of a feel for the heartbeat of what's happening day and night on the property, and it gives us that person that you know should there be an issue in the middle of the night, you know, oftentimes as as part of apartments, you know, we do our best to get great tenants in there. We do full background checks, but you'll still get noise complaints at one in the morning that somebody's stomping and won't won't stop, or their TV is too loud. And having that person um, allows us to to do that. What a lot of management companies will do is they'll just have that person, and they'll they'll try to get that person to do all the showings and stuff like that too, and we. We've found that typically the person that has the strengths, you know, in what we want to see for that on-site don't necessarily, uh, they're not the best at doing the sales and showing the units as well. So we've split that. We'll have that on-site person in every building, and then we'll have those two full-time managers. Um, once they're all built, it will be one for the first two buildings, then we'll probably hire that second person full-time as we build that third building. Um, typically, uh, that person will be there to work 40 hours a week, you know, nine to five or whatever it is in the office. And they'll be in charge of the oversight, the bigger issues, the things like that. But we will have people there 24 seven that live in the building as well. All right, Ron. Thank you. Um, 
Sounds like you thought of everything. Well, I don't know. Um, Probably not. Um, I've, I've been warned that sometimes it sounds too good to be true. Uh, I'm in the contracting business also, by the way. Um, I was doing the math here, and it's, if you divide the total number by the units, it comes about a little over $97,000 per mm -hmm. unit. Um, we just we approved one of our, well, 15th Street flats, and it was more than twice that. Yep. More than twice that, almost close to $200,000 per unit. Um, that brings a big question in my mind. What, what, what are we doing here? And, and that also is a TIF district. Um, we, we've approved several of them in the last few years here, along with many tax abatements. And uh, because of that, um, uh, we've got a 5% increase in our budget this year. We would, if not for those TIF districts and uh, tax abatement, we wouldn't be in asking for more for the budget. So it isn't us up here they're going to be paying for this TIF district, folks. It ain't us. It's all those people living out there in Walnut, Minnesota. A um, couple of questions: Do you, were you sought after to come bring this project here? Uh, in Wilmer, I was not. I actually called um, Aaron and. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, I got a response that they were in the middle of working on the 47th Street Flats or, uh, there, and uh, he called me back a couple months later, and we met up, and that was probably four months ago? Yeah, April. April. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been in communication with him since then. And the reason we're here is because there hasn't been a lot of market rate development, and um, you know, so we saw it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know something that we don't know about? 300 people going to fill these units? Uh, I, I would point to Fergus Falls because it's my hometown as an example. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say this in a nice way, but Fergus Falls has um, less going for it than Wilmer and Alexandria and some of these other communities. Um, our Target's closed, our Kmart closed, our Sunmark closed. We've seen a lot of um, things that aren't positive when you look at job growth and things like that. I managed 250 units in that community. We've had several hundred units built in the past uh, handful of years, and every one of those units is full. And one of the positive things that we've seen, um, about 150 of the units that I manage are older units. They were built in the 80s, um, a, lot, a lot of them with the same government programs that built units in Wilmer. And what we've seen is having newer units really raises the standard of older units too, because it allows, um, you know, when, when we're showing people nice units, then we go show them something older. Yes, it's cheaper, but it'll make us clean up that older unit a little bit nicer too. Um, and it kind of brings the whole housing uh, stock of the community up a little bit, I think, um, you know, which, which can be a positive. But what, what I know is if Fergus Falls can fill that many units, there's no way Wilmer can't. And, and, and I know that probably isn't, you know, extremely comforting to you, but I have not seen any one of these projects that we've done or any other developers like us have done not fill up um, and, and uh, not stay full. And so I, I guess that would be my response. I look at, when I, when I just look at Wilmer, I feel like there's enough job openings in the community and there's not vacancy. These units right now, if we filled every unit, it would really bring Wilmer to what would be a normal vacancy rate in the community. And honestly, um, I feel like it would bring people into the community. I mean, Alexandria has had essentially a zero vacancy rate, and that's a community that we've done a lot of development in for 10 plus years now, it's had no vacancy. And every, we, they've added 600 units in the last 10 years, as you said, I think a little bit more than that actually. And we've added, they've added 600 units and their vacancy rate isn't any higher than it was before. And I think we're gonna see that in Wilmer too. I can't guarantee that or promise it. That's why we're gonna build it one building at a time. But uh, I know for sure Wilmer can handle 72 units. And I'm very confident or fairly confident that it can handle all four of these buildings um, and likely more than that. I agree with you on the millennial thing. I mean, we, we run into that too. They, uh, they don't want to own a home. They don't want all the uh, work that comes along with it. And uh, they're getting married later and later and later and having mm -hmm. kids later and later, which means they don't even think about a home till later and later. Yep. It's affected the housing industry for the last probably 12 years. Um, however, uh, we, we have a lot of subsidized housing in Walmart. I mean, yep. a, a lot of it. I get asked by a lot of my constituents about you know, what, how, how much more do we need in Walmart? Yep. And really, what do we need as a council? How, many, how much more subsidized housing? We have a, uh, of the home ownership rate in Walmart, uh, I, I believe it's well over 50% that's 
rental. And uh, we've seen in the past when HRA has done some projects like this that people leave the rentals in Wilmer and go out to your new one because they've got you know, new appliances and everything's fresh and new. And um, uh, most of it is subsidized. Yep. And uh, we've got people living in Wilmer in older houses that don't have new appliances, don't have new windows and furniture, and they're paying more. Than, than what you would be charging for this. But my, my question is, how much subsidized housing do we, do we need or want in Wilmer? Um, we've got 15 street flats going up. There's 324 units that are gonna be going up on uh, uh, Lakeland Avenue out by Midwest campus. And this is up to close to 300, two something, 280 some. Um, it's a question for us, I guess, is, is how, how much do we need uh, in subsidized housing? And, um, I, I've questioned that every every time that this comes up, and then I've, I've I've personally voted against all the last, TIF districts in the last two three years. I, just, I I can't see doing it. It does give a, in the business end of it. It gives the, the businessman that's owning the building an unfair advantage of cost per square foot, and then he gets all these people coming from other businesses that are charging more because their costs are more. Well, you have an unfair advantage also in doing this, uh, bringing your cost per unit down. Um, and I, I just wonder how much subsidized housing do we want in Walmart? I, I, and that's why I ask, what do you know that we don't know? It, they probably will fill up yep. uh, or we'll get close to a 5 or 6% vacancy rate, which is yep. normal. Yep. Um, but it all it takes a lot of people out of these other rentals in town too. I mean, they just kind of shift gears. Um, we've seen that with, uh, or I've seen it in the last twelve years with HRA housing. I've been on that uh, liaison to that board for a while. Um, I'm not knocking on your door. Yep. Like I said, you've thought of everything. I mean, this is Rick called you a salesman, and that's what you are. <laughs> it uh, reminds me of the Music Man. <laughs> Do you mind if I give you my perspective on what you're asking here? Yeah, shoot, go ahead. Okay, so I, I think there's a couple things. You know, you're talking about subsidized housing, and you're right. You know, the other projects you mentioned are subsidized housing in the traditional sense. There's there's city subsidies, and there's a lot of state subsidies going in there. You mentioned um, the 15th Street Flats, and those projects, you know, traditionally, the state average for those are $210,000 a unit, which is over twice what we're building ours for. And the reason for it is because, uh, I mean, they have 25% soft costs in those projects. We're coming in under 5%. There's a lot of other variables there that we have, that, I mean, with my partner being a contractor, we do everything we can to, you know, keep our costs reasonable. And I'd be more than happy to walk you through, and we've done this with other city councils, walk you through buildings that we've put up before so you can see what we're actually doing. Um, you know, so that's, that's a component of it. The other component is um, the subsidy is very different than, like, 15th Street Flats. To live in that building, I don't know the exact numbers, but typically a portion will be at 30% of median income, a portion at 50, and a portion at 60. Meaning if you make $50,000 a year by yourself, if you're making a, working a $25 an hour job, which there's a lot of people when we're doing that, um, you're not going to be able to live in that building. And 80% of our units will be available to people at any income level. And I think, yes, in a perfect world, there would be no incentive necessary from the city to do that. but the fact is nobody else has been able to do that or, or there would be units up right now if they were profitable to do it on its own. And I'm not saying you have to do it. It's obviously up to whatever you guys feel is in Wilmer's best interest. But this is going to provide a lot more than just the subsidies, which are important that like the 15th Street Flats is doing, but this is gonna be an opportunity for anybody that wants to rent a nice apartment in Wilmer. And I think that's something that is in demand in Wilmer. And it really, there hasn't even been an option for people recently to have something like that. So I think that's a component as well. Well, it appears All we're right. gonna have- We're gonna, that's a philosophy discussion. We wanna move on because we got a council meeting. So. I got a question for the police or the fire chief. Do we allow uh, grills on second and third floors in apartments? Um, no, we do not, according to city ordinance. That's what I thought. Yep. So, so that's You'll something have to that talk to them. We, yeah, we'd have to talk. Maybe there's not a solution to it. Um, these are very different, and we do a lot of fire safety things. So, you know, to it's. I think it could be a unique situation. We'd obviously have to have a discussion and see if it's viable. If it's not, then we don't do that. Maybe you just do a picnic area up there. Okay. But it's something worth looking at. All right, and then to Bruce, 
is all this land outside the city limits right now or some in and the rest has to be annexed in? Some is in, a portion of it will need to be annexed. Okay, and then we have to talk to Wilmer Township then and see what amount they want for taxes that they'll be losing on? That's very specifically spelled out in state statute. We're talking very minor, minor amounts of uh, tax revenue in this particular case because it's been annexed. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Mayor. You know, the conversation we're having is, is, is a good conversation to have. And um, this is free enterprise. Yep. This is capitalism at its best. Yep. This is a young company coming into an existing community and saying, we believe in your community. Thanks for believing in Wilmer, because I believe in Wilmer as well. Yep. The reason we don't have a lot of people coming to us and the reason we haven't had uh, houses or these types of properties built in the last 10 years is we haven't been easy to work with. And there's a number of us sitting around this table that want to change that. And so we're glad you're here. We're glad you're bringing a project and we'll look at it, we'll look at it, we'll vet it, and we'll make sure it's a good project for Wilmer. But this is exciting. This is good stuff. That's all I can ask for. There's one more question. Sean? I was just gonna ask, uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned 10% as a normal TIF district contribution. Is that what you're seeing with all your other projects? This will be the shortest term we've received at 15 years. Alexandria was 18. Um, Wilmer was, uh, excuse me, Marshall was 26. Uh, Breckenridge was 21. Pelican Rapids was uh, 26. Fergus Falls was 18. Um, so those are other communities. And at 15 years, this is on the small side of what we typically see. Now, that was what I was communicated was the most one wants to do, and we're doing everything we can to run with that 15-year number per building. Now, um, I believe Todd had to leave, and, and should we move forward here, he'll, you'll get all the financials, you'll get the rate of return, you'll get all that sort of stuff from him, but I'm confident when he looks at it, he will tell you 15 years is honestly just under what it, what it takes to make this project work. We've still got to cut a couple hundred thousand dollars of expenses on this project somewhere. Hopefully we get some really good business and stuff like that. But really 18 to 20 is what I would typically ask for. But after sitting down with some of the staff, they said 15's, um, in a perfect world, you'll get 15 is kind of what I was communicated. So we're shooting for 15 because that's that's really the bare minimum of what it, what it takes to happen. Um, and we're gonna do everything we can to make our project work at 15 years. And I love TIF districts that generate jobs. Now, this one I'm hearing I'm going to get maybe two jobs from management on That's, the site. But it, this project is more of an infusion of people. This is workforce, bringing them into the community, and they will obviously spend their money in Wilmer and be part of this community. I think you can have the argument, you know, like you said, it's a philosophy thing. You know, do you need the jobs first or do you need the housing first? And they really go hand in hand. You know, you've been doing a lot to bring jobs into the community, um, and I think that getting this type of housing in the community is key to filling those types of jobs. And I think that this is a key, you know, component to doing that. So they go hand in hand. You need a little bit of both. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you guys for your time. So, should, do we get a show of hands to move it forward? So there's to, a consensus. Okay. Would you like to move it forward to a public hearing for December third? I think the majority says yes. So we'll move it forward. One, one suggestion at the hearing is if we could have uh, maybe some uh, something on the screen as far as sight and, and what they're going to look like. I mean, you must have pictures of Alexandria and Fergus Absolutely. Falls and all that stuff. Yeah, that's what I mean. Thank you. Duly noted. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank